What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. And on this Wednesday in the third week of Lent, we continue on through the Gospel of Mark, picking up this time in chapter 10. And we have a little bit of a rough writing from the large catechism, and of course, our ongoing catechesis into the third petition of the Lord's Prayer. Stick around. <music> So this teaching of Jesus that we're about to read might seem kind of removed a little bit, um, divorced from one might say, kind of the, the, the feel that, that it's been. But because Jesus came to bear witness to the truth, it would make sense that those who have tr twisted and corrupted the truth would then come to challenge it. And so we see that challenge coming to Christ, and of course we see in that challenge the perfect answer of Jesus, which drives them mad and inspires them to inadvertently <laughs> carry out God's plan for salvation. So we begin in Mark chapter 10. And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again, and again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. And in the house, his disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Adultery is a touchy subject, one that our culture doesn't necessarily want to hear about. And another teaching of Jesus in this on the topic of marriage, unprovoked, Jesus said, from the beginning, he made them male and female. This, in spite of what culture teaches us, this is God's plan for marriage. And what God has joined together, let man not separate. You've heard me say it in this devotional series before, that God has created and instituted all of these things for our good, and marriage is certainly one of those things that has been instituted for our good. Who do you think it was who gave us our sex drive? I mean, let's be honest. Who is it that created us for the impulse of sexual intercourse with God, of course, and for our good and to our benefit and to the mutual satisfaction of, of ourselves and the other person, God has instituted and ordained marriage, one man and one woman, his institution. And God is very clear. It is the hardness of man's heart that is the reason that even Moses allowed for a certificate of divorce. But marriage also very important to the Christian because marriage serves as a picture of Jesus' relationship with his church. Jesus, the bridegroom, the church, his bride. So husbands, you love your wives like Christ loved the church, giving himself up for her. And wives... Finding yourself a husband who loves you and is willing to sacrifice himself for you and never abuse his authority, but use his authority to serve? Submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for this is pleasing to God. That's why marriage is important, Christians. And I'm sorry to say it, but if we wanted to have a conversation about gay marriage, we've already conceded that argument by allowing for divorce when our Lord and Savior is very clear on the matter. Are you divorced? There is forgiveness for your sins in the shed blood of Christ, and you do not need to bear that guilt. 
repent of your sins, and be forgiven. Now, our writing comes to us from the large catechism. In common trade, one carefully slips something out of another's hand so that the latter must watch out. Or one person surprises and cheats another in a matter where he sees advantage and benefit for himself. Yet this property must not be considered as taken by fraud or stolen, but honestly bought. Here they say, first come, first served. And everyone must look to his own interest. Let another get what he can. The same was done in former times, also with respect to wives. They knew such tricks, that if one were pleased with another woman, he personally or through others, as there were many ways and means to be invented, caused her husband to become displeased with her. And he had her resist her husband and act in such a way that he was obliged to dismiss her and let her go to the other man. That sort of thing undoubtedly prevailed much under the law, and we also read in the Gospel about King Herod. He took his brother's wife while he was still living, yet Herod wanted to be thought of as an honorable, pious man, as St. Mark also testifies about him in Mark six seventeen through 20 But such an example, I trust, will not happen among us. For in the New Testament, those who are married are forbidden to get divorced, Mark ten nine. In whatever way such things happen, we must know that God does not want you to deprive your neighbor of anything that belongs to him so that he suffer the loss, and you gratify your greed with it. This is true even if you could keep it honorably before the world, for it is a secret and sly trick done under the hat, as we say, so it may not be noticed. Although you go your way as if you had done no one any wrong, you have still injured your neighbor. That's right. Even uh, the bonds of holy matrimony are in love and service to our neighbor. Husbands who divorce their wives, wives who divorce their husbands, do injury to their neighbor because husband and wife are still neighbors with each other, even as they are also one flesh. And the rending apart of one flesh is painful and destructive. Maybe, let's think of it this way. God did not say, you shall not commit adultery because he doesn't want us to have any fun. But God knows because he ordained marriage and intercourse for our good, he knows the bond and connection that comes with it, and he knows the pain and the suffering that comes from it being rendered apart. Maybe it is in love that God says to us, I do not want that pain for you. So cleave to one another. Cling to your spouse. Do not divorce them. And turn to me in times of trouble. Pray, forgive, love, pray, forgive. <laughs> and for all of your sin, there is forgiveness in my son who suffered and died and rose again for you. Now we continue our Lenten catechesis, this time the third petition of the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In God's kingdom, although we have prayed for the greatest need, for the gospel, faith, and the Holy Spirit, that he may govern us and redeem us from the devil's power, we must also pray that God's will be done. For there will be strange events if we are to abide in God's will. We shall have to suffer many thrusts and blows on that account from everything that seeks to oppose and prevent the fulfillment of the first two petitions. If we would be Christians, therefore, we must surely expect and count on having the devil with all his angels and the world as our enemies. Matthew 25, 41, Revelation 12, 9. They will bring every possible misfortune and grief upon us, for where God's word is preached, accepted, or believed, and produces fruit, there the Holy Cross cannot be missing. Acts 14.22 And let no one think that he shall have peace. Matthew 10.34 He must risk whatever he has upon earth, possessions, honor, house and estate, wife and children, body and life. Now this hurts our flesh and the old Adam. Ephesians 4.22 The test is to be steadfast and to suffer with patience. James 
7 through 8, in whatever way we are assaulted, and to let go whatever is taken from us. We have this comfort and confidence, the devil's will and purpose, and all our enemies shall and must fail and come to nothing, no matter how proud, secure, and powerful they know themselves to be. For if their will were not broken and hindered, God's kingdom could not remain on earth, nor his name be hallowed. We pray. Merciful Father, your patience and loving kindness towards us have no end. Grant that by your Holy Spirit we may always think and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.